All right. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining us today at the European Parliament to address a very important topic. So how can we make uh, sure that our diets are sustainable and how we can make sure that uh, they respect the norms in the EU? So we gather today uh, here to confront a difficult uh, reality. So our food choices significantly contribute to biodiversity loss, climate change, and of course also to other environmental crises. Moreover, poor quality diets have also consequences on our health, uh, causing risk of diseases, the issues that touch upon almost 60% of the adult population in the European countries. Recent uh, scientific advice uh, emphasized the need to integrate health and environmental sustainability consideration into dietary guidelines. However, the existing guidelines often fall short on aligning these sustainability goals. Traditionally, policy efforts have focused on providing consumers with information to empower them to make healthier and more sustainable food choices. However, we must recognize that food choices also are influenced by other aspects that go beyond the mere rational thinking, which is, for example, availability, habits, emotional responses, and cultural influences. Moreover, trans uh, transparent information regarding environmental and social aspects of individual food choices are often not only the only solution. So today we aim to explore what constitutes environmental sustainable diets and what are the barriers that we need to confront in order to uh, have better and more healthy uh, sustainable diets inside the EU. So uh, the focus of today's event will be around uh, a key uh, sorry, scientific uh, research uh, proposed by the European Commission Scientific Advice Mechanism, the SAM, providing valuable insights on the topic of today's discussion. So uh, before we start, I would like to thank you all for being here today, specifically our excellent set of speakers, and of course, Mr. Oleka for taking the, the, the lead with the event organization and hosting today's discussions, and our colleagues from Sam and Sepia for their support in the event organization. Um, before providing the floor to the hosting MEP for his opening remarks, I would just uh, like to provide some housekeeping rules. So for those of you who are attending uh, in the room, uh, we will have a Q&A session later on in the event. So feel free to just raise your hand if you have any questions. For those who are attending online, uh, please feel free to enter your question in the chat box. And please make sure to mention to whom your question is best addressed, and we will collect some of your questions and ask them to the panelists during uh, the Q&A session. So without further ado, I would like to provide the floor for, to Mr. Olekas for his opening remarks. Thank you, Regina. Dear colleagues, uh, friends, uh, uh, in the EU, around uh, 11 million farms produce agricultural products for processing by about 300,000 enterprises in the food and drink uh, industry. The food processors uh, sell their products through the 2.8 million enterprises within the food distribution and food service industry, which delivered food to the EU's 500 million consumers. This is a huge part of the EU economy and the essential sector for maintaining our security and sovereignty. But the current uh, food system also poses significant environmental changes, including biodiversity loss, as you mentioned, water stress, and climate change. As a medical doctor by profession, I, am, I can uh, tell you that good nutrition is essential for good health. Uh, recent scientific uh, advice, which will be presented during this event, suggests uh, that diets should integrate both health and environmental sustainability consideration. I would also add economical consideration. Just providing consumers with information is not enough for sustainable food choice, as decision making is influenced by various factors, including habits, uh, emotions, and uh, cultural norms. For example, people should be careful to not give into exotic food trends, trends that uh, have uh, only intended by very damaging effect to local population around the, the world. We know that if some specific kind of grain or plant become very trendy in the Western world, this demand raise the price globally and the local and indigenous 
population of other countries are not longer able to afford something that was uh, the uh, stable food for generations. We have to be careful of our effect on the rest of the world. I think that the affordability of food is a question that uh, we are not uh, speaking about enough, especially in the farm to fork strategy. For example, in Lithuania, households spend on average 21% of the income on the food. That is a lot compared to, say, Netherlands or Belgium, where they spend only about 11 or 12 percent. The people in those countries may be able to afford some increase in, in food price because of the lower productivity or higher standard put on agriculture. But my uh, country, Lithuania, consumers cannot. One of the points is that uh, if we want to buy a diet that is not only healthy for the consumers, but also good for the climate and environment, we should give more attention to diets that are based on local products and obtained through the short supply chains. That not uh, only gives us access to nutrients that our bodies have over generation developed to need, but also saves the planet from the emission of long delivery uh, roads and helps uh, solve the problem of food waste, the shorter the supply chain, the less opportunities there are for the food waste to be created. We now uh, put forward strategies and goals that aim to make agriculture more climate friendly. Unfortunately, they also lower the food production. If the farmers use less fertilizers and pesticides, if they leave some of the land for the biodiversity, the yields get smaller. If they have no, if they have to use uh, expensive technologies and meet ambitious standards for environment and animal welfare, the cost of their operation rise. At the same time, the budget for the supporting the farmers through the common agriculture policy is shrinking. This is uh, where the new technologies should come in the in and it can help a lot with the planning and implementing a short supply chain, bringing producers and consumers closer together and providing farmers with the new tools. For example, just last week we voted on the report that should allow the use of new genomic technologies in plant breeding. It is an instrument that can help us achieve the Green Deal objectives to get higher yields uh, with less input, using less land, less chemicals, or even radiation-active uh, uh, materials, less water, and produce the plants that are more resistant to the effect of climate, climate change, diseases, and pests. Generally, to promote sustainable diets, there is need for information on the environmental, social, and economical impact on of food choice, uh, along with the tools the, and policies that you level to overcome barriers. And I hope that today we will discuss some of these uh, problems and prepare some recommendation. Thank you very much for participating in this conference. Thank you very much, Mr. Oluekas, for uh, already presenting very well and opening very well the scene of uh, today's event, mentioning already some key aspects when it comes to sustainable diets, so the environmental impacts, the economic impacts when it goes to our farmers, but through the whole value chain, and also, of course, the social aspects. And thank you also for highlighting what the Parliament is currently doing on these topics. Um, I would like now to provide the floor uh, to Ms. Mia Petra Kumpulanatri, who's the co-chair of uh, our intergroup on climate change, biodiversity and sustainable development. Thank you so much. And I'm very, very happy to see that we are followed more than 65 people online too, and the full uh, room here in, in the parliament. So very proud that the, our uh, group in the parliament can provide this uh, debate forum. It is very, very valuable as the food and, and sustainability and the topics here discussed 
are uh, cross-sectoral, across policy lines, and this is the best the, uh, our intergroup can uh, plan and, and offer. So thanks for the chairing uh, this one and, and, and being the host, I'm, I'm visiting, uh, visiting uh, chair here. But let me bring some thoughts, uh, personal thoughts, not, not anything to do with my role as a chairing the, the, the group. Uh, I have uh, three points the where we should look at this one, the information and then the pricing and then the policies. So the, on the informing side, I want to bring uh, greetings from my home country, which is Finland, that the digitalization and, and the, the inform, informing citizens can and also help a lot of the making people aware of the consumer choices that they can do. Uh, there is a Finnish independence uh, uh, fund think tank called Citra that offers uh, online uh, si uh, tests of the uh, kind of life cycle test where you can also test your food consumption and, and uh, uh, footprint, CO2 footprint of your food you are, are consuming. And it has been popular 1.7 million times visit its site. So not often the EU policy page by commission or even parliament gets that much attention. But this one is nice. You can go and test. So there is need for information. And I'm very happy that it will be published in, was it eight countries now very soon? So that we can also uh, start informing people and, and not to... Uh, only regulate them to do that, but start the shift uh, with the voluntary choices. Then doing that, it also brings the good mood in the society to look at your nutrition and then and, uh, think about it. And also for the professional who are then catering and serving the schools, kindergartens and so on. So I think that better informed consumer, consumer will be able to make better choices. So the, also the research shows that in Finland, the, the average consumer can reduce the climate impact of their diet with 30 to 40 percent by simply choosing different products. So that is uh, one way uh, to go. So um, then sustainable choice has to be make the obvious choice in terms of affordability, availability and overall desirability of the product. So then the, the very good driver is all, always the prices. So how to reach the prices that a product needs uh, reflect the external environmental and social cost that they later on will have. Uh, and then how unhealthy and unsustainable products will be more ex expensive. So not to mention any uh, concrete way how to tax, but then it's being considered in many countries many times. Uh, and then also, can we think of the positive price incentives and, and, and the repurposing of economic subsidies that could help that affordability of the health and sustainable choices is the criterion again, could not be overlooked when looking that one. But then also, on the, uh, as the chair here started very well, the, the farmers must be on board. So do we have it on the supplier side that producing sustainable and healthy products to become more profitable choice for them? And also, when I was preparing this short note, I, I, I found the, the UN Food and Agriculture Organization FAO revealed analysis on 2023 on the pol policy tools and also that how to see the factor of hidden cost on the food in the decision making. It's huge if, if it's even at the 10 percent of the global GDP that uh, is affecting uh, everything that we do there. Uh, and I think that when we produce food, the waste is all too big share, and I wonder that it is not more up in the political debate. It was in Finland, for example, time to time that is, should it be like legally uh, done, or is it only so much on the shoulders of NGOs that collect and, and take the food from one place to another? There are different systems in different countries, but then it is still many institutional uh, even places when the food is not... Uh, properly used uh, on its best. So the third one is, of course, the policies, what we do. Uh, I love the uh, title, Farm to Fork, because it really puts the whole chain in the same picture, but it's, it needs to be developed, and it, we do not afford to being divided there. I think it is important to see that it is European farmers to produce the European food, even we change the, the, some topics there. So whether you change more for uh, oats paste uh, 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 food instead of purely uh, meat uh, uh, nutrition, it will be the European farmers. So, so taking this on board that it will not be uh, leaving the, our farmers as they are our life uh, supporters and, and actually the uh, 
pre-consumption uh, or the, the whole uh, basis for our uh, life here on the continent. So I think the socially just uh, sustainable requirements needs to embed a lot which is uh, what is socially just. It is the price, uh, price for the consumers in these days. Very much uh, attention needs to be paid on that one. But then also the, the farmers cannot bear alone on the, the, any, any change here. But we also cannot miss the goal on the climate neutrality. And that's why it needs to good policies to look. I think the holistic food policy is the better title than look it from one perspective only. And it, of course, the food links to the cultural heritage, but I'm a strong believer that not, no uh, culture, fit, uh, or I don't actually get, get any culture heritage that would be so different that we could not take these uh, steps towards. I will uh, listen with the big ear, the, the scientific uh, comments on this one, because I think that no nation was very much uh, overweight or used too much processed foods when our cultures were created. So I think that it, it is possible to combine that one and maybe not one size fits all, even when we look at the uh, heritage of the European nutrition-based uh, uh, food culture. So nice to have the doctor, medical doctor here. I'm the daughter of the cooking teacher. So uh, good uh, to be here and I look forward to the discussion and the specialist to speak. Thank you very much, Ms. Kumpulanatri, for such a well-structured um, intervention and for opening the events, already tackling three important points, so information to consumers, digitalization, price, specifically when it comes to availability, affordability, and of course, the policy tools, the policy tools that should take in consideration also the social and cultural aspects. So thank you very much to both of you for setting the scene with uh, today's event. And it's uh, time for the keynote presentation of, uh, of today's event, uh, provided by Professor Eric Matthijs, um, who works at the University of Leuven, KU Leuven, and of course um, also related to the scientific advice mechanism um, at the European Commission. So today, Eric, you will present us uh, the presentation focusing on towards sustainable food consumption. I know you have a PowerPoint, so I will share it uh, from my side, and you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. So yes, uh, I'm uh, Eric Matthijs, and to be very precise, I was the chair of the working group uh, of experts advising the, as you can see on the on the slide, the group of of chief scientific advisors. And so the the, the mechanism is that the chief uh, scientific advisors write a scientific opinion based on an evidence uh, an evidence uh, report. So. Um, so I'm the, the chair. I was not. Uh, I'm not one of the chief advisors. I'm. I'm, I'm just just chair of the working group, um, piling up the evidence. And of course, I was not alone. As you can see in the uh, next slide, we were a group of very diverse uh, uh, experts. Although, if you would read out the names, you would probably see some biases in terms of gender and in terms of North uh, Europe, and maybe also um, you know other parts of Europe that may be over or underrepresented. Uh, please be assured that the, 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 the SAPEA uh, and the SAM uh, uh, put a lot of effort in uh, getting an expert base, which is as diverse as possible, a representative as possible for the different uh, uh, diversities that we have in Europe, but especially also disciplines. And I was very happy to be, as an agricultural economist, sharing a, a group of experts um, covering uh, uh, economics, but also sociology, uh, uh, behavioral psychology, health sciences, environmental sciences, food science, uh, food processing. So all these um, uh, policy sciences, so all these disciplines were in the room, which is, I think, key uh, to write a, 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 a good report. Uh, also very important to take notice of is on the next slide, you can see the brief that we got, because if you get a... a if you get a, a brief like this, you have to be within that brief and not outside the brief. It's very important, which means that uh, some elements are not part of the report because they were already part of the farm to fork strategy. So the brief was what concrete actions could be taken at EU level. That, and that's also a very difficult issue because, of course, many food issues 
uh, are actually the competence of member states or, or cities or, or, or local governments. In addition to those announced in the Farm to Fork strategy to overcome the barriers and preventing consumers to adopt sustainable and healthy diets, fostering the necessary change towards sustainability in the food environment. Yeah, so please keep in mind that we were operating within that brief. Uh, our approach, oh no, maybe very quickly take away messages. In short, marketing works. Marketing, which means uh, price, uh, product, place, promotion, the four Ps, it works. If it wouldn't work, businesses wouldn't use it, right? So it actually works. It's, we know it works very well. But it also means that if you're marketing the, well, the wrong uh, patterns, products, uh, that also works, right? So we see some marketing practices that contribute to unhealthy and unsustainable food consumption. And I might add here, especially in vulnerable groups. And vulnerable groups uh, may mean many things. Huh? Uh, 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 people with less uh, uh, education, for example, it's more difficult to reach them. Uh, children, obviously, uh, elderly people. I mean, there are lots of uh, of vulnerable groups that have also special needs, but are also very much uh, vulnerable to these marketing practices, which means that indeed, as was already mentioned in the introduction, and which is also supported by scientific evidence, to focus only on information is not enough. We are, we are more than just rational beings when making decisions, uh, which means that a more systemic and more holistic approach is needed, not only for that reason, also for some other reasons that I will highlight later on. Okay, our approach was as follows, as, as you can read on the next slide. Uh, kind of three parts of the report. We kind of uh, really, uh, and it was really a consensus in the expert group. We first zoomed out. We really took a food systems approach to really show, okay, individual choices is one thing, but they happen in a food system. Uh, and we have to acknowledge that there is all kinds of elements in that food system that have to be taken into account and that we may actually ignore sometimes. And I'll, I'll, I'll give a couple of examples in a minute. Secondly, then we zoomed into, you know, what are indeed effective interventions in the food environment. This is really the scientific core of the project. What does science have to tell us in terms of how we can change uh, behavior towards more healthy and sustainable diets? And then we zoomed out uh, um, with some policy implications and some policy elements that we uh, proposed. Okay, so for the first part of food systems approach, and here just uh, a couple of things in the next slide. Uh, you see, uh, no, I first have to say this, of course. What is sustainable and healthy food consumption? Uh, now, our, this was not actually the focus of our report, right? We were, the focus of our report is what works in changing towards healthy and sustainable food. It's not a discussion on what is healthy and sustainable food, which of course is tricky because we may kind of all agree on that we have to go that direction, but we do have different opinions on what it actually is. So we kind of stuck as much as we can to national recommendations in this respect. For example, if you can see in the middle, one, uh, and national recommendations are mainly health-based, huh? Uh, but there are an increasing number of member states are also uh, using environmental elements into that, which means that one should eat a plant-based diet rich in vegetables, fruits, whole grains, pulses, and fish with moderate amounts. Moderate amounts doesn't mean no. Huh? It means moderate amounts. It means less probably in many cases, but not all cases. Uh, with moderate amounts of low-fat dairy products and limited amounts of red processed meat, salt, added sugar, high-fat animal products. We acknowledge, of course, that these recommendations are uh, implemented to be implemented uh, taking into account cultural differences, different needs of different population groups, obviously, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And also the fact that a dietary pattern is actually, you know, it's, it's not just quantities, it's proportions, it's variety, it's combinations of different foods, and not just, you know, individual products, yeah? Uh, uh, and that also varies considerably across Europe. Yes, we have a common, we have some common course, obviously, yeah, but there are also a lot of variation across Europe that has to do with different uh, natural uh, resources and so on, uh, and also with big changes over time. 
From an environmental perspective, uh, I think there's quite a consensus that animal sourced or animal based uh, foods in general have a higher impact than plant based foods. So I think there is quite some consensus. We don't we take it kind of for granted that that consensus is there. Uh, I'm afraid on organic and, and local, it's uh, let's we call it there is a mixed mixed evidence. It's mixed effects. You really have to take into account all factors. Local can be good, but if you would eat a Belgian tomato at this moment, it's probably not a good idea, right? You probably have to eat a tomato in season, but a, you know a locally grown tomato at this moment, grown in Belgium or anywhere else in Europe, uh, actually, you know, uh, probably not a good idea for the environment. Uh, and the same for organic. Organic, I know Farm to Fork strategy wants to promote organic, which is probably a good idea for biodiversity. But at the same time, uh, we need more land if dietary patterns do not change. And so there's always trade-offs to be managed there, except for one actually kind of low-hanging fruit, which is reducing food losses and food waste, right? because there is a win-win uh, uh, without any doubt in that respect. Okay, then moving on to some elements in the food system. This is a very nice graph in indicating that individual behavior is really happening in a food environment, the interface, you know, how people buy food, how they eat food, as a lot of factors that influence that. I'm not going to talk about all these elements. I just want to draw your attention to a couple of elements. One was already indicated, digital. Food environments are increasingly digital, which uh, provides a lot of opportunities as the the MAP already indicated, but also a lot of threats. Uh, social media have potential, but also, uh, you know, uh, some, some, some negative trends, they can reinforce that. And they are, they are there, and they're, uh, uh, they're important. Uh, artificial intelligence is, is going to be an important part also of, of dietary advice. But what's also infor important is that in some regions in Europe, informal food environments are also important, which is a problem in, in science we, we've tend to focus on the formal food environment, but in some, especially in Eastern Europe, the informal uh, home, home, home production, for example, is still quite important uh, for people to, to get their livelihoods. And so we, sh we should also, when designing policies, take that into account, um, this as aspect of informal food environments. There may be a third element, and there's many more that we can say about it, has to do with power. There's also increasing uh, scientific evidence that the power imbalances in the food chain creates, of course, all kinds of problems, uh, which means that businesses that are commercially driven may indeed uh, have the wrong incentives uh, uh, in, 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 uh, in promoting healthy and sustainable food and may lobby actually for, you know, stopping legislation. And I'll not say more about it because this is an evidence-based report. So, but of course, you know, in the discussion, you may highlight that, uh, aspect a, a bit more in detail. Okay, let's move to, uh, to the next slide. Uh, I was actually personally surprised by the, um, the broad consensus among the scientists that indeed individual decision-making is not just making rational choices. There is a large consensus that these are psychological processes, especially when in relation to food, that they are based on habits, on routines, on semi-automatic processes, which are very in influenceable by, of course, uh, the food environment, uh, and also by emotions, eh, by affective process, in addition to cognitive processes. Of course, cognitive processes uh, matter, but we are very much uh, habit-based animals when it comes to buying our food. Whereas we do see that policy mainly focuses on these cognitive processes. Uh, the informed consumer is the basis of actually most European policies or member state policies, which means that education is the basis, uh, campaigns, uh, good information is the basis. And we don't say that's not true, but it's not enough. Yeah, it's, it's, and especially when you look at more vulnerable groups, which are more difficult uh, to reach in terms of information, it's definitely not uh, enough because it's especially those vulnerable groups that do not have the, that have more barriers in going towards more, um, I mean, cost, obviously, the price was, was mentioned. Uh, uh, but this is not the only one. There, there are many more barriers of uh, motivation, personal capabilities, cooking skills, obviously, that may have been lost, are maybe 
TikTok can help us regain some of these cooking skills, if they're the right cooking skills, obviously. Uh, so, uh, you know, physical opportunities, social opportunities, they all matter. They're all, there's a long list of barriers that we report in the, uh, in the report, and that, of course, makes it very complex to change uh, behavior. But it also means that we need more disruptive measures to actually change behavior, to alter the context of food-related behavior. And to change these routines, people really need to be shaken up. Uh, when do people actually change their behavior? It's mostly when something in their life drastically changes. They get married, they get children, they stop smoking. I don't know. That's when they do it, right? That, that's what I mean with disruptive measures. So it means that you know, something disruptive needs to happen also in the policy uh, uh, domain to really change behavior in the long run. All right, the next slide. Uh, yeah, so then we move through the, uh, uh, the core of the report. Of course, we were very meticulous in basing ourselves on as much as we could on meta reviews, you know, established science. Meta reviews are reviews of scientific evidence that meets certain minimum criteria, because you can imagine, of course, there's lots of uh, reports out there, but they do not all meet uh, the, the right criteria. And yes, information matters. You know, there's lots of studies, especially when it comes to more healthy uh, behavior, where we see that results based on experimental uh, studies, they do show that information matters, but they also show that the effect is rather small, moderate. Yeah, so health labels, for example, they do have a positive effect, but it's relatively limited. Yeah. If we move to sustainability, there the evidence is relatively poor. Of course, there's some overlap. If you promote more fruit and vegetable consumption, it's good for health and it's good for sustainability. But we have much less, especially experimental studies that focus on sustainability levels. It's really more emerging. Uh, and the evidence is there is, is much more mixed. And that has to do with the fact that people are much more motivated by health reasons than by environmental reasons. That's just a fact. Uh, of life, and I think that reflects itself also in these in these labels. So yes, it's important to inform people through labels, but it's not enough to actually change their behavior. Uh, and of course, uh, one of the I think uh, uh, policy advice, uh, and also this is uh, backed up by by scientific evidence, is that we should really restrict advertising to children as a vulnerable group. So information matters; it's not enough. Product formulation also matters. And it's actually very effective. Uh, uh, and it's also uh, based on experimental studies. And especially silent uh, food reformulation helps. But what doesn't help very much if it's only based on voluntary approaches. You really have to make it mandatory to really see an effect. If it's voluntary, well, then it really, uh, the effect is relatively small. The third uh, element in the food environment, place. Place refers to many things, but here it mainly means where in the food environment can we find a certain product. So the prominent placing of something uh, at the checkout or, you know, where it is in the, in the, in, in the retail outlet or how a restaurant would, uh, you know, uh, offer, for example, uh, things on the menu. Uh, these are all elements in a place. And there you find overwhelming evidence that that actually matters a lot that when putting something healthy and sustainable in a, a prominent place, it has, uh, or remove the unhealthy ones from a prominent place. I may refer to the UK legislation that actually uh, uh, has, uh, I think, forbidden uh, some unhealthy foods uh, at, at checkout uh, places. But that really improves consumers' uh, food uh, choice, and that also relates to the positive effects of healthy food stores and negative of I mean, especially the negative effect of fast food restaurants in, in a neighborhood. There are studies that really show the association between obesity or, or BMI, high BMI of ch in children and, you know, fast food outlets in the neighborhood of, um, of, uh, of schools. So these are really elements that uh, individually matter, right? but of course uh, there are other elements. Price was, ma uh, was uh, mentioned, so in the next slide. Now here I'm, I'm, I'm an economist, but at the same time, I'm very uh, cautious because here we don't have the same kind of evidence because it's very difficult to do experimental studies with, you know, prices. 
from an ethical perspective. So here the evidence is more based on simulation studies and it's much weaker than, so from a theoretical point of view, yes, it, it, it makes sense to make the unhealthy and the unsustainable stuff more expensive, also to, to include uh, external effects. But in a practical matter, you know, it's, it's much more, it's, it, there's, there's uncertain effects. There's especially distributional effects uh, that, that, again, from a theoretical point of view, you can you can uh, you can solve, but to do it in practice, it's much more difficult, and we don't have a lot of experiences. And actually, if there are some experiences, they were they were stopped pretty pretty uh, quickly. I think the we have most of the experience in the sugar taxing, especially globally, and especially, for example, in a country like Chile. Uh, which is really a nice example where uh, a comprehensive set of policies were, were taken in that respect. But here I feel much less confident in, in, in saying, well, there is, you know, a lot of evidence where pricing really helps, you know, we don't really know very well how that works, uh, which doesn't mean that we shouldn't do it. It's just that the scientific evidence is, is different and it's, it's, it's more difficult it needs more research, obviously, in that uh, respect. And I, maybe one point I would like to add also, you know, framing, and I think uh, the thing is, if you make, uh, if you include externalities in the social costs of food, it would make, of course, food more expensive. But it doesn't mean that the amount of money that you should spend on food should increase. You can change your behavior. Actually, that's the whole idea behind <laughs> Uh, in, in, including the environmental effects, is that you change your behavior. In other words, you should change to, I mean, plant-based products should not become more expensive. It's the animal-based pro, uh, products that should uh, become more expensive. But it means that if you do have a pricing policy, at the same time, you also need to inform people how to change their behavior and to keep their budgets balanced and stuff like that. And maybe the last point, which is the, the social environment, the digital environment, as I said before, the, it opens up a door, uh, especially for personalized feedback uh, through apps, dynamic feedback. And don't also underestimate the effect of the social environment because, you know, it refers to what culturally we think is the norm. And governments have an overwhelming um, uh, responsibility here, I think. Uh, but they tend to refrain from, you know, or they're, let's say they give, they tend to give different signals to the population in what people should eat. They have national recommendations, but at the same time, you know, they promote advertisements in different ways. What's also important to add here is that interventions can have dynamic effects. What that I mean is that, you know, you, you may implement a policy targeting product formulation, but of course, food chain actors will adapt to that and may actually take other actions that actually will undermine that initial. Uh, so that actually, that's what we mean with taking a holistic systemic approach is we need to take into account the actions of the different actor, actors when we uh, design policy. So to conclude uh, into some, uh, how, how am I doing in time? Um, okay, so to conclude indeed. Eh? Um, uh, we need a integrated and coherent uh, approach, uh, not only at EU level, but at all levels. And that's a very difficult uh, uh, challenge, obviously. But we need a policy. The main message actually is we don't need a set of individual instruments. We need a mix of policies that is coherent. That's actually the main message. And that mix should take into account, you know, uh, feedback effects, possible uh, counter effects of, uh, of food system actors. And at the same time, we also need to take into account non-market, informal, and increasingly also digital elements uh, in the food environment. And maybe I should leave it there to keep it in time. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you very much for uh, such a comprehensive presentation. I mean, uh, hard to summarize everything you have mentioned because uh, it was uh, really touching upon 
a lot of uh, different aspects of, of course, what is the definition uh, when, it, when we discuss about uh, healthy and sustainable food consumption. Of course, what are the, the bottlenecks when it comes to price, the social norms, habits, and all these are aspects that we actually will discuss very soon during the panel discussion, and of course, the policy uh, implications, and uh, of course, also some uh, suggestions. Um, so moving on now with the panel discussions, uh, I would like to present the speakers that we have today for um, joining us in the room and online uh, for, uh, for our panel discussion. So uh, today we have Anastasia uh, Alvisu, Deputy Head of Unit of Farm to Fork at Digisante at the European Commission. Joining us online, we have uh, Lynette Marie Neufeld, Director of Food and Nutrition at FAO. In the room, we have Camille Perrin, Senior Fo uh, Food Policy Officer and Team Leader at BELC. Uh, we have Bo uh, Bohmen, uh, Senior Manager of Nutrition and Health at Food Drink Europe. Uh, Dr. Eva Sali, Senior Policy Advisor at Copa Cogeca and Rosalie Tucker, um, Senior Policy Advisor at Europesh. So um, we have heard a very comprehensive presentation uh, from Professor uh, Matthijs. So my first question to you, um, it's based on your, on your uh, expertise and your point of view, what elements should be a primary focus to attain health and sustainable food consumption in the EU? Um, so it's a one minute answer question question because we're running a tiny bit late in our schedule. So I would like to provide uh, the floor to Anastasia to start with. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for the invitation and for being a member uh, of this panel. I would like to thank Professor Mateis uh, for the excellent presentation and I really want to underline uh, the work that Sam has undertaken both with the, with the two opinions that I have delivered in this area. The, before the Farm to Fox strategy, there was a, the preparatory, a lot of preparatory work was because of the same opinion and now uh, focusing on the sustainable consumption. And I think we all agree around this table that food and food matters are very uh, difficult. They're very emotionally charged subjects. They're very complex and very sensitive and they speak to to our hearts in, in many, many ways. Um, if I have to distinct, I, I would say, it's very difficult to distinguish an element, but I would say, uh, and I think Professor Mateis has already mentioned, we need a systems approach and we need to combine it with the One Health approach to make sure that uh, our objective, our approach should be improving the human health, animal health, plant health, and the health of the environment at the same time and do that through a, a coherent mix of policies. We cannot have, there is not one type of instruments. We need multiple instruments on all fronts. So actually it's, it's a contradiction with the question. The one element means a more, we go on all fronts uh, with uh, regulatory and voluntary measures, with incentives, disincentives. We need action at TU level, we need action at national, but we also need action at local and regional. And this is something we must not forget. And at the same time, we need all of us, all the food system actors, to share the same vision and to be able to talk about it and to communicate. And I think that will get us there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anastasia. Very, very clear and very comprehensive. Uh, moving on to Lynette, uh, who's connected online. Hi, thanks. Thanks very much for the invitation. It's very nice to be here and I, I've really enjoyed the, the presentation and discussion so far. So I, I just want to, for this first one minute, I want to focus on um, the level of integration of the actions. So there can be no sustainable consumption without sustainable production. They are intimately related. And so we heard quite a lot about consumer facing actions, but really a comprehensive strategy needs to embed also the production facing strategies and bring those together. So for example, just a couple of examples, how can we be changing the, the price structure of the foods unless we're really taking a hard look at agricultural incentives trade and so forth. And that really needs to come together 
as a part of this package. Similarly, it's fundamental that we start to look and, and really take a close and deep look at the environmental and health footprint of the foods that we're consuming. Just because it's plant-based does not mean it's healthy and it doesn't mean it's environmentally friendly. There are high, there's a growing body of evidence around the important role of highly processed foods for health outcomes, but there's also a growing body of evidence of their role around environmental footprint, and that's really fundamental. So that nuance in the language and the, uh, has, to, has to permeate through everything. That nuance needs to be in our language, that nuance needs to be in the policies and the, and the consumer-facing actions that, that go forward. And then just the final, we did hear a bit about food loss and waste, but I think it's an under, perhaps slightly under um, emphasized point that I want to bring in. Um, and maybe just as a, given, given the one minute focus this time as a placeholder that we can come back to that. Uh, but food waste is an enormous part of the challenge. And, and a lot of that, some of that is within the power of the consumer um, and fundamental that we, that we really, um, have clear uh, education along with that food choice, clear education and motivation and actions that promote and enable and, and really support consumers to make better choices that lead to less food waste. Thanks. Thank you, Lynette. And indeed, as you were saying, food waste, it's uh, of course an important point that probably will come back also later on in the discussion. And very well noted when you say that no sustainable consumption can happen without no sustainable production. So those are very fair and good points. Um, giving now the floor to Camille. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much also from, from my side for the invitation to participate in this uh, panel debate. Uh, just briefly before answering your question, uh, a couple of words about Berg because the name is not uh, straightforward necessarily. So Berg is the European Consumer Organization. We represent uh, 45 national consumer organizations across Europe, uh, and we bring their voice to EU policymakers. And in a nutshell, uh, basically, our daily work uh, involves making sure that EU policymaking improves the lives of, of consumers. So now back to your question. Um, I guess from my perspective, it's, more, it's less what elements uh, than who uh, should be the primary focus of policies. And there, uh, our reply would be clearly the middle of the chain. So that's the actors between the farmers and the consumers. So that would include uh, the food manufacturers, the retailers, the food service sector, restaurants, but also I would add uh, uh, public procurement. And this is because, as we've heard from Professor Mateus, uh, so far existing policies are focused a lot on the farmers with the greening of farming practices and consumers with education and labeling with the, the lack of success that we, that we know. Um, yeah, the food processing and, and retail sectors have a huge influence on the choices made by farmers on the one hand and consumers on the other hand. So we really think that we would need to tackle, uh, to address those actors more. Um, take consumers, for instance, two sort of consumers do their grocery shopping in, in supermarkets. Um, we also have uh, for more and more people eating out of home, purchasing uh, food online with meal delivery apps. A million of children every day eat in school canteens, so we really think that uh, targeting those actors can really do a lot to uh, facilitate stable food consumption. Thank you. Thank you very much, Camille. And passing out the floor to Bo. Thank you very much. Um, also, thank you uh, for inviting Food Drink Europe to be present today, and thank you to the previous speakers for interesting um, uh, talks. So first of all, what, what should be the primary focus? I think what has been said by colleagues before, we need the collaborative approach uh, across the agri-food chain really to, to foster sustainable food systems. And as the food and drink industry, we are centrally placed between the farm and the fork, right? So we believe that we also play a crucial role in this transition. But i just like to mention that the work is not starting from zero. A lot of work has already been uh, done in the last two decades. For instance, there have been tremendous efforts in product reformulation to support uh, balanced and more sustainable diets. But of course, a lot of work is left to be done. Um, but to facilitate this transition and stimulate healthier and more sustainable food systems, we need an enabling environment. And of course, um, it's only possible with such an environment. And for this, we need um, proper investments, uh, a supportive, innovation-friendly environment, 
uh, we need to be boosting trade and secure supply. We need to focus on better regulation and also improving governance and policy coherence. The latter specifically uh, to avoid contradictory of EU policy proposals. Um, and for that, uh, we call specifically for a dedicated executive vice president of the European Commission on Food to help avoid potential trade-offs on food safety, environmental goals, food security and economic sustainability. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bo, and thank you for bringing forward a specific uh, recommendation to have an AVP on, uh, on food. Um, so moving on with uh, Dr. Eva. Silo, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. I would like to start by uh, highlighting a couple of points. Well, first of all, the project represents uh, nearly 65 national organizations of farmers and agro-cooperatives that come from all 27 member states. Then on the point and answer to your questions, a couple of things that need to be um, underlined and the fact that well, first we need um, a definition of what is sustainable and one that is uh, that goes beyond environmentally sustainable, it includes also the socioeconomic aspects. Secondly, in our view, uh, we should stop limiting uh, sus and environmental sustainability to greenhouse gas emissions and more specifically to CO2 and methane. It is much more than that. It includes, for, uh, for instance, food security, circularity, resilience and other aspects that need to be taken into consideration, including biodiversity and uh, other. And thirdly, we need to connect the social policies um, with the uh, supply chain policies and basically make sure that uh, low-income populations have access to a healthy nutrition food that is affordable and this is something that uh, MEP Oleg has uh, highlighted uh, and that is important and includes also animal-based foods which are uh, the highest uh, quality proteins. I would like lastly to echo the comments made by Lynette when it comes to plant-based diets and the fact that uh, there is no free ride when it comes to environmental consequences. So be it animal-based or plant-based, we need to look at the, pro at the diets rather than at the products and not assume with sweeping generalizations that one is more sustainable com uh, compared to the other. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and will I provide now the floor to Rosalie? Thank you very much. Um, so speaking of daughters of, I'm actually a daughter of a farmer, but I haven't heard the word fishers um, or fisherman at all today. And as a representative of the fishing industry and also from personal observation, I just want to say, like, I believe one of the primary focuses should be on the fishing industry, the fishers and the communities that are belonging to it, because they are providing us already with one of the most sustainable, low carbon and very healthy food protein that there is. And I think we would do really well in celebrating this by supporting it, promoting the products uh, and improving the competitiveness of the sector in the EU market. It hasn't been, we had some challenges, COVID pandemic, uh, we have high fuel prices, uh, Brexit, etc. And we're having new targets while keeping up the high levels of, of standards that we're having on the sector for like environmental sustainability, um, labor conditions, etc. Um, and efforts made, I think, can be rewarded a bit more by, for example, um, promoting the seafood products. So people are also more informed of sustainable choices. And it is interlinked also with the career prospects in the in the fishing industry. So they can continue to provide us with this option of sustainable um, a diet or a a fish product in the sustainable diet. So really a focus towards uh, I, a way of being proud of the fishing sector and also of seeing it as a crucial um, sector to move towards a more sustainable diet, a more sustainable food system, and not only seeing it and recognizing, but also showing it not only to the consumer, but also to the fishing sector and the fishermen and communities as well. Thank you. Thank you, Rosalie. Thank you for bringing forward the fisheries uh, perspective in the in the discussion. So I would like now to um, ask you all a second question. Uh, so for this one, you will have five minutes. So it's going to be a tiny bit more relaxed uh, to answer the question. 
So uh, starting with uh, Anastasia, so given the dual perspective, so the health one and the sustainable, the environmental sustainability one when it comes to the guidelines uh, that we need to provide to consumers, uh, what specific initiative or strategies does the European Commission envision to implement at the EU level to enhance transparency and provide more effective information regarding the environment and the environmental and social aspects of individual food choices? And moreover, how does the European Commission plan to collab with different stakeholders, such as the ones that are here today, so the, the food industry, public health organization, and more, to ensure a coherent and comprehensive approach towards making sustainable diets the norm inside the European Union? Yes, thank you. It's actually quite a dense uh, question. So uh, we are in the middle of a transition. Uh, we are moving towards the next policy cycle. We have the European elections in summer, the European Parliament elections this summer, and then the new commission. Uh, so I will present basically what we have done so far and work that is still ongoing. Um, the President of the Line already in the State of the Union speech expressed the, the commitment also uh, that we continue to be ambitious about the European Green Deal and its implementation. So that is meant to stay. It will be still relevant in the next uh, policy cycle. What was also uh, something that also Professor Mates, you mentioned, we need to, cha to change a shift in, in people's diets. It has to be, uh, it needs a kind of a shock eh? because we are uh, prone to habits. Uh, any choices are done. We can see to, uh, every day as consumers, we make so many choices in our life. So when we go to the supermarket, we go for what we know. Uh, so we actually, the importance of a food environment, which nudges consumer choices, is instrumental. In that context, we have been working at the Commission to, uh, to prepare a legislative framework for sustainable food systems and enabling environment, setting out also common definitions, uh, also definition of sustainability, addressing the three dimensions of sustainability, and uh, uh, make sure that this necessary, uh, how can I say, uh, in order to accelerate the transition in all policy fields. Amongst the elements that we have been examining in this preparatory work are, is the concept of a favorable food environment, how to stimulate uh, a favorable food environment for sustainable choices. And the elements we have looked at was, of course, sustainability labeling and labeling that address the three dimensions of sustainability, economic, social, uh, including health and environmental, but also public procurement. And public procurement has uh, an adapt potential that we should explore. Um, and this comes together with the remark that information to consumers does not suffice, simply because we are products of routines. Our choices are products of routines. Uh, so we need to do interventions, especially at schools, uh, school canteens uh, with public procurement, where actually habits are being formed uh, and routines are being um, created. Uh, so we will be also preparing actions to support sustainable public procurement of food and catering services with that objective in mind. Food waste, I could not agree more with food waste, uh, with the, uh, the food case waste uh, remarks. More than 58 million tons of food waste are generated in EU, and this corresponds to 16% of the total GHG, uh, GHG emissions for the, from the food system. So uh, here uh, we can do a lot uh, and uh, the Commission has come last July with a legislative proposal setting uh, food waste reduction, mandatory food waste reduction targets to be achieved by 2030. Member states should reduce food waste by 10% in processing and manufacturing and by 30% in retail and consumption levels. Discussions are ongoing. So we hope that there we can make a difference in terms of sustainable consumption. 
Innovation and research, yes, it's also very important. It was mentioned before by the speakers. Um, Food 2030 is the EU's research and innovation policy framework that can help drive this transition uh, and to gather knowledge on how to foster uh, data, rate, data rate shifts. Another also uh, element I want to mention is the monitoring of the farm to fox strategy. It was announced. It was part of the farm to fox strategy, and it's supposed it's it will be coming. Uh, we're uh, working together with the GRC, the Joint Research Center of the Commission, uh, to publish very soon a dashboard on indicators in 2024 uh, in the fir in the first half of 2024. In the coming months, precisely to see um, where we are in the transition to sustainable food systems. And there we can also see where we are with sustainable consumption. But all these EU policies cannot deliver on their own. Member states have to join forces here. They have the elements to uh, build upon the EU policies. They can use tax policy. They can also use uh, nutrition policies. Nutrition is a very important element. The exclusive, co the competence on nutrition matters is, does not rest only with the union. Member states can also do on their own a lot of things, especially through uh, aligning their national policies to their, their national dietary guidelines. And there we don't see, we often see a mismatch. Uh, they can do also education strategies as well. And we have also seen recently that in some member states, they also take measures to address advertising and practicing practices by creating appropriate food environments. So not to promote unsustainable, unhealthy food in certain areas around, let's say, schools, as uh, Professor Mateus mentioned. So this kind of uh, practices really build further and take EU action at another level. We also count a lot on the operators, and we had the, uh, we had, uh, the code of conduct. We have the EU code of conduct uh, on responsible food business and marketing practices. Uh, it was launched in 2021, and now it counts 141 signatories. And we see that uh, uh, most of the commitments, 90 commitments uh, from 46 companies, are actually focusing on healthy, balanced, and sustainable diets. And half of those uh, commitments relate to composition of foods, availability of healthy food options, and portion sizes. So there is a movement also on that front. And I mentioned food system approach, and we need that also in terms of governance. We need to talk to each other. Everybody needs, we need to bring together all the food system actors. And again, I want to underline, we need to talk also a lot to the local actors and to the regional actors, not just the national counterparts. Um, maybe I'll stop here and I, <laughs> we can continue the discussion in the Q&A. Thank you very much, Anastasia, and thank you for uh, focusing on the many important works that the, the, the Commission is doing as of now when it comes to uh, sustainable food systems, also defining what sustainable food system means. Um, when you discuss about innovation and research with the Food 2030, and of course, super important, the monetary of the Farm to Fork um, strategy and the work you're doing on that with the, with the GRC, but also about the shared responsibility when it comes to member states and also the national and, and the uh, local uh, level. And we have today a representative from the Committee of the Regions, so that's, uh, that's great. Um, so moving on, um, with the next question addressed to uh, Lynette. Uh, so FAO uh, has been very vocal on the need to, to shift to more sustainable diets and food systems, recognizing the intrinsic in nature of sustainability in diets that expands beyond nutrition and environmental concerns to encompass economic and social cultural dimensions. So what particular initiative and strategy does the FAO advocate uh, on, at the European scale to foster, for example, awareness or education, behavioral change with things we have heard so far during um, our colleagues' presentations and considering uh, the factors such as food availability, availability um, cultural preferences and uh, economic considerations. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that question. It's, it's a big question and I think a lot has already been said around those needed policies. So let me 
Let me start with a few basic um, areas that we're working on um, that will lead to some of the, the other, a few additional specific, uh, specific topics that we could discuss. So I want to start out with what is a healthy diet? A healthy diet provides nutrient adequacy. It provides diversity, balance in energy and sources of energy, and moderation in unhealthy foods. It's very simple. And I think one of the things we must do is counter the many, many messages that are out there in the public media on one side about what constitutes healthy and be cautious in among ourselves in speaking with a common voice about what is healthy. It is those four principles and jointly with WHO, we'll be releasing a joint statement shortly uh, related to that. I wanted to mention those because when we talk about dietary patterns, and I appreciated the reference to dietary patterns during the presentation, there are many, many dietary patterns that are healthy. How, how do we know whether they're healthy? Well, they meet those four basic principles, adequacy, diversity, moderation, and balance. So there is no one single uh, dietary pattern that we should be encouraging, we should rather be encouraging and working with populations to be able to meet those preferences and, and cultural uh, aspects and tradition and the socioeconomic barriers that, that continue to exist with a dietary pattern that respects those and is also healthy. That's where food-based dietary guidelines come in. And um, within the next few months, hopefully, we'll be releasing a new guidance document for the, for the development of food-based dietary guidelines that bring in uh, particularly environmental sustainability considerations, also socio, so, uh, social considerations and considerations of equity. Um, and that's fundamental. And several countries in Europe have already been developing food-based dietary guidelines uh, with those considerations. In the past, those have been used as a tool primarily for consumer education, but we have to use them as the basis of food and agriculture policy. There is, if you look at countries, there is not necessarily alignment between what we are asking consumers to eat based on those dietary guidelines and the reality of food availability and affordability in those countries. We've spoken a lot already about affordability, it is those guidelines that should be informing agriculture incentives, shifting production patterns in a way and, and trade or any other element that is needed uh, to, to ensure that, that those food really are available and affordable. So let me talk about two of the, the topics that have come up quite a lot. I think some of you already have seen the, the relatively recent report on terrestrial animal source foods, and this is picking up again on that messaging around production systems as well as consumption. Um, we released the um, as a systematic review, very thorough review on the health risks and benefits of animal source food intake. And one of the key messages that comes out of that report is that not animal source, all animal source foods are the same in terms of their health risks and health benefits. So again, nuance of message, not all animal source food has health risks, not all animal source, some animal source food have very little if any health benefits. We need to be nuanced in that messaging to help consumers navigate that space. We are currently finalizing a report that does a similar model, but looking at production systems. And at the end of those, we will have a final report that brings all of that evidence together into um, balancing the trade-offs and the opportunities related to both consumption and production of animal source foods. We've also started a similar initiative related to animal source food alternatives, because again, they are sometimes being promoted as uh, a benefit both to health and environment simultaneously, but let's be careful here. Again, there are multiple types of products, multiple different processing mechanisms used in those products, and there is no blanket. We should not be using blanket statements of, of um, health benefit and environmental uh, benefits. So that, that series of reports 
uh, is looking at uh, the current state of evidence of, of a variety of different types of, of animal source food alternatives for um, environmental implications, health and nutrition implications, uh, socioeconomic equity implications, and food safety implications. So hopefully by the end of this, was, this one's a little bit earlier on in the process, but hopefully by the end of the year, we will have that. And the language I'm using there, again, coming back to that nuance of language, is very purposefully, I'm not saying animal protein alternatives, I'm saying animal source food alternatives, because in fact, it is protein that as a nutrition expert working in this field for many, many years, I'm least worried about. Animal source foods are rich sources of a variety of nutrients, and protein isn't very e difficult to get from other sources. What we need to be looking at is the whole um, a variety of nutrients that are being uh, that are being potentially re replaced by those products, and the extent to which we are not going to leave gaps in the dietary food source as those shifts are made. So, coming back to that question of adequacy, adequacy is a fundamental adequacy of all nutrients that are essential for human function is a fundamental component of a healthy diet that we can't that we can't uh, neglect. Um, related to that and, and bringing a lot of this together, uh, I'm sure many of you are aware of the, the pathway report that was launched at COP, uh, at COP um, and we will be working with countries to explore that uh, pathways and options and potential regions as well um, to meet the, the 1.5 degree as well as SDG2. Um, so that's an area that, that uh, FAO will be continuing to work extensively in. So then just coming back to a few, I think I'm almost out of time, but a few uh, very specific areas. Uh, there's a very nice report, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, called Nourishing, um, the name of the report is the Nourishing Policy Status uh, Update in 30 European Countries. And I mention this because it goes through um, 10 policy areas that include uh, key, key policy needs across food environment, food systems, and around the consumer facing and the behavior change communication, and provides a status of the current policies in, the European, in those 30 European countries. And what you see is that there are really critical gaps across several of them, um, and particularly, for example, around restricting food advertising in the forms of, of commercial pr uh, promotion. And again, this comes back to that core criteria of moderation. We have to confront the reality that the unhealthy foods are, are um, appealing, inexpensive, and, and um, have permeated all aspects of, of the food environment. So if, have, I just, if you're not familiar with that report, uh, it was pointed out to me one, by one of my colleagues who is also uh, providing a few additional bits of information in the text as we speak. Um, it is a very good report to nudge us in some of the directions. It doesn't go down into detail. So for example, harnessing food supply chains and actions across sectors to ensure coherence with health, that's a very big umbrella of potential policy actions. Um, but again, linking that and thinking about what our food-based dietary guidelines are telling us and, and doing a bit of a matching of where we are now with where we want to be in terms of food supply in each individual context uh, is a really powerful, uh, powerful tool that we can't, um, can't neglect. So I think, you know, all of these, what we're aiming for here is, is restricting on the unhealthy foods, whether that be through taxation, whether it be through labeling, we're seeking to promote the healthy foods and to enable those healthy foods. And that comprehensive and, and coordinated set of actions really need to bring that together. And that has to include all the way from production to those, to those consumer facing actions. I didn't go into the detail of some of the, the work that we do intensively, because I think it's been messaged already, public procurement, schools, fundamental, and, and we can't say enough, but I think quite, uh, quite a few of the speakers have already mentioned. So I'll leave it at that and perhaps uh, call out to my colleague, Anna, could perhaps uh, drop in a few other links of, of different documents and guidance documents that are available from, from FAO. Thanks.
Thank you very much, Lina. Thank you for um, bringing forward the work that FAO is doing in providing guidelines on healthy and sustainable diets, and also for reminding us that there is not just one dietary pattern that could be considered as sustainable, but there are many of them that could be considered as, as such. And uh, just confirmation from my side that your colleague has shared uh, the, um, the reports information in the chat box of, um, of the platform. So um, moving on now with um, with uh, Camille. Uh, so you have uh, presented quickly uh, already the work of uh, of BEUC as an umbrella organization representing consumer different independent consumer associations, and of course BEUC uh, has uh, an important role to play in amplifying the voice of consumers at the European institutions. So. Uh, based on this, what suggestion do you have today uh, for the implementation of tools and initiatives at the EU level that extend beyond information provision, actively addressing obstacles preventing consumers from embracing sustainable diets, such as we have heard, habits, routine, and social cultural influences? Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I would like to say that uh, we've been extremely pleased by the, the same reports that were published last June because they uh, they came as a confirmation of what we consumer conditions have been saying all along, which is that uh, we need to make it easy for consumers to eat um, LCD and sustainably. So it's really a message that we've been trying to convey for years. So now it's really uh, backed, supported by scientific evidence that uh, was presented earlier today. Um, I'd like to come back to the, the, the issue of diet, because when we compare uh, consumption patterns in the EU today with dietary guidelines, it's clear that... Uh, the way most Europeans eat is not healthy. Um, they don't eat enough fruit and vegetables. They don't eat enough whole grains, nuts, and legumes. And at the same time, uh, they eat too much red and processed meats, too much fat, sugar, salt, and too many uh, calories. Uh, we also know that only 12% of European consumers eat their uh, five a days. You, you're all familiar with the five a days. And at the same time, um, meat consumption in many countries is two to four times higher than what's recommended. So. We have an issue with, with current diets. I also would like to refer to um, reports by the European Environmental Agency or the Scientific Advisory Board on Climate Change, which have really made clear that a diet which are heavy in animal source foods have a significant environmental and climate impact. So that has to be uh, really stated clearly. So we need to change the way that we eat. Uh, the good news is that uh, most consumers are willing to eat differently. It comes clearly uh, across uh, many opinion surveys and polls. So there is this willingness to change the way they eat. Uh, the problem is that few consumers have actually uh, changed the diet. Uh, according to um, a Eurobarometer poll that was published uh, two years ago, only one in five have actually changed the diet. So there is this gap between intention and action. And this is because, as we've heard for, for Professor Mateis, uh, the food environment today makes it hard for consumers to uh, turn their good intentions into, into action. Um, I wanted to maybe expand a bit on the concept of food environment because it might sound a bit jargony and dry. Uh, however, we as consumers experience it in our daily lives. And um, I wanted to also draw your attention to a report that we published, I'm um, not sure if you can see the, the cover here, uh, last June together with the European Public Health Alliance and your group for animals. Um, we called it the illusion of choice because the purpose was precisely to illustrate with concrete uh, real life examples how food choices uh, and diet by, of consumers are influenced by the food sector. Um, to give you maybe a few examples, we've heard uh, some already, but um, the food environment, as you can experience it as a consumer, can be anything from, for instance, the, the supermarket promotional leaflets that uh, tend to advertise mostly unhealthy food as opposed to rather healthy choices. It's also this uh, big displays of crisps and soft drink that you can come across at the entrance of the supermarket and that push you to buy these products even though they were not uh, initially on your shopping list. It's also those meal delivery apps that push notifications on your smartphone with discounts for burgers and fast food. Or it's also, for instance, uh, as a parent, I of when we walk to school with my kids, we often come across, you know, in the streets, uh, those uh, billboard ads. It's mostly for burgers, pizza, soft drinks. So it's really something that, uh, even though as a consumer, you might have the best uh, intention in the world, push you towards certain choices uh, as opposed to other choices. So that's why we really need policies that address the availability, the affordability, and also the desirability of healthy and sustainable food. Um, first, on availability, uh, we've heard about already uh, reformulation. We really think that we need to uh, tackle reformulation 
in the farm to fork strategy, there was um, it was envisioned at least to set maximum level for certain nutrients. We think it was a good idea because indeed self-regulation has not sufficiently delivered. Um, we also need monetary requirements uh, for public food procurement. So we are happy to hear that this is still uh, ongoing work. Also the cap, the common agricultural policy could play a role to um, incentivize, uh, to increase the availability and therefore incentivize consumption of certain products, fruit, fruit and vegetable, for instance. There could be, uh, for instance, voluntary couple support to increase production of, of those products that consumers need to, to eat more of. Uh, moving now to uh, policies to increase the affordability of healthy food. Um, we have a problem with price signals today. As a consumer, if you want to eat healthy and sustainably, often you need to pay more. This is not how things should be. If you want to incentivize healthier choices, more sustainable choices, that should be also the most affordable option. Um, so there could be a role, um, again, for uh, the cap. Uh, it was mentioned before by, uh, by Lynette as well. Maybe we need to look at repurposing certain farm subsidies to support more products that should be produced more. Uh, it's been um, suggested in some FAO report. There could also be a role for some uh, carbon pricing mechanism. Um, there, in some leaks that were published of the um, European Commission communication on the 2040 climate targets, there were some hints at potential carbon pricing mechanism, and that would make indeed certain products more, uh, a bit more expensive. So that could be a way to um, address price signals, but there, as a consumer condition, we want to also add maybe a big caveat, which is that the way such mechanism would be built should be uh, socially just and fair, because we need to make sure that all consumers can still afford uh, the food they want to eat, sustainable, healthy food. So that's, but it's at least, if we want to be coherent in the, the way pricing works, we need also to look into this. But it doesn't have to be just about regulation. Also, retailers can do a lot um, because the way they price product also has an impact on the, uh, on the, on the consumer purchase. And I would like to, to share, for instance, uh, examples by uh, some positive examples that we've noticed. Um, the first one is uh, Lidl in the Netherlands. They have announced recently that they would... Um, align the price of whole grain products on that of uh, refined grain versions. Often, unfortunately, uh, whole grains, despite being more healthy, is more expensive, so it's a good thing that they will now try to uh, align prices. Um, another example is um, some three German retailers who have recently announced that they would uh, try to move towards price parity between uh, meat-based and plant-based products. So I've heard um, earlier the uh, Lynette calling for more nuances in how we uh, address those products. It's, it's very true, but we also need to recognize that if some plant-based food are very highly processed, it's the same also for some highly processed meat products. There are many examples of sausages which have very little meat content inside. So uh, I think nuances can need to, to, to work really both ways. And uh, in Consumers need also certain uh, convenient alternatives if they want uh, to try to move towards more plant-based diets. So they, they really role, there is a role for those products. And uh, what we also insist very much on is uh, on food manufacturers to try to improve the recipes of these products. Um, and finally, also uh, still linked to prices, member states have a role to play uh, through, uh, social, uh, through fiscal policies and, and taxes. Uh, many of our members have been calling on their uh, government, for instance, to abolish VAT on fruit and vegetables and legumes to lower the relative price of these products. Um, now, when it comes to the attractiveness of healthy and sustainable food, uh, it's also about making the less healthy, less sustainable choice less attractive. And there we would totally concur with the um, previous comments about restrictions on the marketing of unhealthy food to children. Um, despite voluntary commitments by the food industry, children are still very much exposed to advertising for food in fat, sugar, and salt. So this needs to be addressed. And it's good that some countries such as Germany, uh, Spain, are making progress in that direction. But also the, the EU should um, be a bit more consistent um, in this respect because we, we have the, um, the promotion policy for agricultural products. And there we continue to, uh, the, the EU continues to fund promotional campaigns uh, for red meat, for instance, even though at the same time consumers receive this, the recommendation that you should perhaps eat less of this product. So there, there, there are some inconsistencies there. And finally, on um, 
um, the, the policies that would help consumers to identify the health system of choice in the shop, uh, that is basically labeling, um, there is a lot that still needs to be done. We are still waiting for uh, the proposal on front of pack labeling, and as book we very much support the nutri score. Uh, origin labeling is also a pending initiative. They, it, consumers want to know where their food comes from. They also want to know uh, how sustainable is their food. So we, we very much look forward to any initiative in that respect. Same for animal welfare. Uh, consumers would like to know how animals were, were raised. So we have the egg labeling system that works well. Maybe it's time to uh, also expand to some other products. Um, so there is still a lot to be done. So I will stop there. Uh, but definitely, I think for us, the message really that information and education is important, but by far not sufficient. So there is a long list of actions that also need to be implemented. Thank you. Thank you very much, Camille. Thank you for bringing in the consumer perspective and for providing concrete example on the three pillars you have uh, mentioned, so availability, affordability, and um, attractiveness. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much uh, for your insights. So moving on uh, now in the agenda and um, addressing uh, the next question to uh, Bo. Uh, so the food and drink industry plays a significant role when it comes to promoting healthier and more sustainable diets. So from your standpoint, how can the sector actively contribute uh, to diminishing its environmental footprint, especially when it comes to greenhouse uh, emissions and the sustainability objectives, all this while ensuring economic viability? Thank you. Um, so the food and drink industry uh, sources 70% of agricultural raw materials directly from European farmers. So as a sector, we rely heavily on having access to sufficient, high quality and the quantities of such raw materials. Therefore, we of course recognize the urgency of collective efforts to reduce greenhouse emissions, uh, to promote biodiversity at the same time while ensuring food and nutrition security and delivering high quality products uh, to consumers at affordable prices. Um, at the same time, we also recognize the need for providing a sound economic return throughout the supply chain to make it um, to ensure sustainable competitiveness, right? So I will give a, a couple of examples on what the industry is doing to reduce the environmental footprint. So I mentioned already um, the sustainable sourcing, right? So the industry can influence sustainability by sourcing ingredients and raw materials in a responsible manner. So this includes supporting sustainable agriculture and fishing practices. When it comes to energy efficiency and emission reduction, the food industry can invest in cleaner energy sources and technology to reduce carbon footprint. Uh, on product reformulation, as already mentioned before, uh, there's uh, a lot of work being done already to um, support sustainable diets. Uh, for example, there's many different countries that have public-private partnerships and have specific reformulation projects in place for many years. When it comes to consumer information, uh, it's really important to support and educate consumers about sustainable food choices. This includes labeling and, of course, also by the use of digital means, awareness campaigns and truthful marketing. Now, food waste was mentioned several times by many people today, so I just wanted to uh, highlight that we are supportive of the SDG to have food waste per capita by 2030. And uh, specifically, uh, in the Food Drink Europe Action Plan on Sustainable and Resilient Food Systems, we are working on a toolkit to help businesses reduce food loss. So we hope to be sharing more about that in the next months. About packaging. Of course, the industry is heavily investing in the transition to sustainable packaging. Of course, there has been some challenges, uh, for example, by the lack of infrastructure in collecting and sorting in many different countries. Therefore, we need uh, an enabling environment, which I mentioned before. This includes also enhanced extender producer responsibility schemes and introducing deposit return schemes. There are challenges, but there are also opportunities. And if we get things right, we can really drive the transition. So I mentioned it before, the Food Drink Europe Action Plan on Sustainable and Resilient Food Systems, which we um, actually published already in June 2022. And it's our translation, like our implementation really, to the EU Code of Conduct for Responsible uh, Food Business and Marketing Practices. And in this action plan, we have launched several 
initiatives and um, actions uh, to support companies in the transition to sustainable food systems. And it's focused around three pillars. One is on climate change, on sustainable packaging and nutrition. So what are the companies already doing uh, right, to uh, reduce uh, environmental footprint and to con uh, contribute to more sustainable diets? I'll give some examples. So 10 of the largest food companies are already investing 1 billion euros in sustainable agriculture. Um, companies are also investing in recyclable packaging, recycled material like pets, uh, and also working with farmers and support them financially to adopt sustainable farming practices such as regenerative agriculture. Now, when it comes to sustainable diets in, in practice, what can we do to make it easier for consumers to choose balanced and sustainable diets? We, of course, as food manufacturers, have a significant role to play in promoting sustainable consumption. Um, I mentioned before, and I will say it again, uh, on product innovation and reformulation. Manufacturers can develop new products and also uh, reformulate existing products to make this choice easier for consumers. This can be done by uh, investing in research and development and creating options that are appealing to consumers and support their active and balanced lifestyles. Now, of course, reformulation in itself is a highly complex process but uh, companies are heavily investing in it since many years to optimize the nutritional composition, but also, for example, by reducing portion size. Uh, on this, uh, as part of the Food Drink Europe Action Plan, we have published last year already um, specific toolkits on product innovation and reformulation, which targets us mainly to SMEs to know what they should take into account when embarking on the reformulation journey. In addition to this, we have also published guidelines on uh, portion size communication and whole grain and fiber consumption. Uh, a second example is that uh, the food industry can influence from the supply chain upstream, so providing opportunities uh, to implement sustainable practices from sourcing to production, so including uh, reducing losses, improving energy and resource efficiency. Um, on consumer information, we support by uh, providing uh, clear labeling to consumers, but it has to be supported by awareness campaigns and education. Finally, on packaging and waste reduction, uh, the industry has been reducing packaging waste and finding innovative solutions for sustainable packaging. And I would like also to make a reference to the marketing and advertising, which has been mentioned several times today, uh, so that many food and drink companies have already contributed to the creation of the EU pledge or are signatories to the EU pledge uh, or any other equivalents uh, at national level, which is targeted at reducing children's exposure to marketing and advertising of foods that are particularly high in salt, sugar and fat. So all of that to conclude that uh, the food industry is already playing a big part in uh, reducing uh, environmental footprint to contribute to healthier and sustainable diets. And uh, we look forward to playing our part together in the larger agri-food chain. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bo. Thank you for uh, giving us some uh, key example on what uh, European industries are doing when it comes to competitive, sustainable resources. Um, cleaner energy resources, packaging, labeling, education, and so on, and of course also for working more closely with farmers and consumers. So that's a great, uh, great insights to today's event. Um, so moving on to the next uh, speaker, so Eva. Um, so in light of the last protests that there have been uh, all around Europe and also specifically in front here of uh, the European Parliament, I think the least we can say that European farmers are not very happy. Uh, so from your perspective, can the production of more sustainable food products can align with the growing demands from both EU institutions and citizens, as we have heard here today, to create, can, can all this be achieved without jeopardizing the economic stability of our European farmers? Thank you very much. This is, uh, well, a difficult question uh, because it is a packed one. Um, so... Uh, starting with the fact that, indeed, farmers are not happy, and uh, the reason for that are many. 
Uh, but most importantly, the fact that uh, the economic burdens, uh, bureaucracy, a large pile of um, legislative developments, uh, imports, etc., are making their lives very difficult, and they are basically struggling them. So the economic viability of farmers is at risk at the moment. Um, hence, the need for the strategic dialogue, and also the calls from the Commission President for more for more dialogue, less polarization, and uh, abandoning a top-down approach. Um, now, on the concrete um, question that you asked regarding the sustainable options and uh, uh, the sustainable uh, food products as well, so farmers and agro cooperatives, they are. Well, the, they are the ones that produce our foods, and they are very much uh, um, working in providing sustainable, um, nutritious, and affordable food for nearly half a billion European citizens, but also all uh, citizens beyond the EU. Um, and they are doing that in the most sustainable way possible, given the toolkit and the time, etc. Of course, there is more that can be done uh, in the transition towards sustainability. However, uh, in doing, and we are committed to do so. However, there is a need for uh, for time, for investments, and uh, for the appropriate toolbox in order to make the transition possible. Of course, in this process, nobody can left behind. And we need to make sure that the economic uh, sustainability of farmers is uh, secured, because without without it, there is well, there is no food to put on the table. Uh, and in the EU, we can pride ourselves in the fact that uh, our food production system is one of the most sustainable, if not the most sustainable, because it abides to the highest standards that exist. Um, so, uh, what can uh, be done to um, uh, further that? Well, first, we um, we need to make sure that we avoid any sweeping generalizations, as our political statement as I said earlier. And I echo again the comments made by uh, Lynette that we need to have a more nuanced approach. Uh, that is when it comes to uh, what is sustainable food consumption, uh, about the diets, and of course about the possible um, alternatives. Um, so very much welcome the comments that she made, uh, where we're not talking about alternative uh, proteins, but rather about alternatives to animal-based uh, foods. And therein we should be very careful, because uh, as FAO indicated in their report back in 2023 in April on the terrestrial animals, um, animal source foods that can provide high quality proteins. Of course, they're not the same. There are risks and opportunities, and all of these have to be acknowledged. So any um, blank statements that they should be avoided as they are not, um, well, they're not truthful and they risk misleading. Um, I would like to address also some of the comments that uh, were made by my colleague uh, Camille uh, when it comes to the CEP uh, incentives for food and uh, food and veg. Uh, food formulations and um, yeah, the pricing. So when it comes to the CP, uh, we need to be careful. First of all, that these uh, any interventions are compatible with the WTO, uh, and second, need to take into consideration that uh, when we are promoting one system over the other, uh, or try to do so, that. We take into consideration the um, the fact that there is no free ride when it comes to the environmental consequences. So if we were to swap animal production with plant-based production, uh, that would not necessarily mean more environmentally sustainable production in the sense that if we were to look a little bit beyond the uh, CO2 emissions and methane, we would see that um, according to estimates from GAIN, by 2050, when it comes to land use or the use of nitrogen and phosphorus, plant, the production of fruits and vegetables would by far exceed that uh, of animal uh, production. So these are some of the nuances that we need to go and take into consideration. And it builds on what I mentioned in my uh, introduction statement, that sustainability needs to take also into consideration the these elements, uh, including the the social uh, as well, biodiversity, resilience, food security, and so on and so forth. 
Uh, then on the food reformulation, well, um, we're not, uh, farmers are not in, uh, in agri-cooperatives are um, not always able to uh, change uh, or to reformulate their products, especially when it comes to uh, products such as uh, the ones under quality schemes, uh, so the uh, GI products. Uh, so we need to be careful when mandating a blank uh, food reformulation. Um, then I believe uh, that on the promotion policy, um, indeed the promotion policy provides support uh, for promoting agri EU agriculture products, and that support is provided not only to animal-based products, but also to fruits and vegetables, and a whole range of other products. So it is available to all, and it's available on the basis of promoting those schemes and also on being sustainable. We need to recognize that um, well, all sectors can be sustainable and give them the opportunity to increase their sustainability. So, um, yeah, I would like to conclude by saying that uh, all production systems can be sustainable and they need to be supported in their efforts to further improve their sustainability. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Eva. And um, thank you for reminding us about the strong economic burden that our farmers in the EU are, are facing and, of course, the need for more dialogue and less polarization and, of course, um, as Lietan was saying, the need for a more nuanced uh, approach. Um, so moving on to the last speakers of today's uh, panel discussion, uh, Rosalie, uh, representing Europesh. So uh, the, uh, you have mentioned this before, that the blue food can provide key solution as a low carbon uh, source of protein. So from your point of view, how can we promote healthy diets that can be equally consistent with the sustainability goals, therefore enhancing the contribution of the sector to more sustainable seafood options in the EU? So in answering your question, I want to build upon what has already been said, but diving a bit more into the fisheries uh, figures to make my point. First of all, I think on average we eat around 24 kilograms of seafood in the EU. And I want to mention this because when we talk about the sustainability on, uh, of our food systems, I think it is also important um, to look into food security and our level of self-sufficiency. So the, the production that we have and, and the ratio between the production and the consumption. And the EU seafood self-sufficiency is below 50%. And this means that um, together we eat twice as much as we produce. So we produce for human consumption around 4 million tons of seafood. Um, but we import almost 9 million tons. And it's not super black and white. Um, it is a little bit unbalanced in there because for some fish species we we are probably we are very self sufficient, but this might not be the species that we like to eat in the EU, and perhaps there's also better prices to that we get somewhere else outside the EU market, and also some species that we like to eat like tuna we actually eat more imported tuna than what we provide, um, perhaps more examples closer to to your heart like we like to eat salmon here but a lot is coming from norway we like to eat shrimps again it's norway or greenland um tuna mostly from ecuador uh, sardines are coming from morocco we like to eat uh, pollock and um, pangasius and this is from asian countries china vietnam etc so just to, to make a point that there is a bit of unbalance in here. And as already mentioned, the consumer and as its individuals, we have a big role um, to play. And we have an impact with our choices that we make on the climate and on environmental crisis, uh, but also on the sustainability and the livelihoods of the fishing sector. As the report is mentioning, uh, consumers do need to change their um, the foods that we are eating uh, and what really doesn't help in the fishing sector's regard is that we're eating fish and seafood sourced from unsustainable managed stocks. So having a high environmental impact, often stemming from countries, non-EU countries, not saying the EU fishing industry is perfect, 
but at least we know what our standards are and how we implement them. So well-informed consumer already been mentioned numerous times. It is crucial. And even though if you're a very motivated consumer going to your supermarket and you want to make an informed choice, sustainable choice, it is difficult and you're limited to what the stores are providing. So we're, it's almost impossible at this point to assess a, a product on the actual impact it has on the environment, on social issues, on climate, on whatever you find important. So there's a lot we can improve here so that we as individuals, we can make our impact. Uh, as also said, most of the power and the impact that can be made is in the middle of the supply chain. So whether retailers are, because as consumers, how we change our behavior, what can really help is if we make it as easy as possible to provide these sustainable and healthy choices. Um, but for that to happen, it needs to be available. It needs to be affordable and it needs to be accessible. And when we make our choices, it's often, let's be honest, like it's routine, it's habits, it's convenience. It's like the supermarket next to your house on a Sunday or on your way home from work. So retailers, schools also, the food that they provide, that is where the better choices can be made and where the big impacts can be made. And I think it is really nice to hear because we heard a lot of uh, the responses, uh, responsibilities lying on consumers, but um, we can brief a little here because um, we do have an impact as individuals and our choices on mitigating climate change, et cetera, but it's not only our responsibility, luckily. And I think food should also, it is fun and should stay that way. It is about culture and sharing. And, um, but we need to, I think we could be more curious and also be more informed and also demand for this information. So it can be more like a win-win-win situation, right? That you can buy the products that you like, but you also know it's a better choice in terms for your health or your sustainability aspects, standards that you want to choose for. Um, on enhancing the fishing sector's contribution to more sustainable seafood options, um, to answer that, the EU's current focus is a lot on, on green transition, energy transition, on environmental sustainability. So new targets are added there to already um, the standards we are to ever more increase the sustainability of the fishing sector, and rightly so. But we believe that these ambitions, they really need to be extended to non-EU country producers. Because in our case, um, two thirds of what we eat in the EU on seafood is imported. Uh, so you might think going to supermarket or store that all the seafood products that are there are complying to the high standards that we have in Europe, but this may very well not be the case. So one of our members said recently really nicely that the EU is actually making us play football, the fishing sector in that sense, but allowing others to play rugby. It's a different game. It's different rules. We cannot move towards 100% self-sufficiency. We know that this might not be even a great goal to have. And the EU will always continue to rely on seafood imports, but um, all EU new initiatives, I think, should include regulation and restrictions on food imports from places where the production causes major environmental damages or high risk to it, like fish source from unsustainable managed stocks. And if you apply EU standards as much as possible to imports, it will be having a great effect on our way of tackling climate change, environmental challenges, but also on supporting the primary production sectors that we have in the EU complying to high standards. Um, and I think, especially in the fishing sector case, it is not as attractive anymore for the young generation to, to work in. Um, which is very well a problem for our sustainable diets and our choices that we have because we have this nice sustainable project there um, and there might not be enough fishers anymore to maintain the EU seafood production in the future. So there again, what I highlighted in the beginning, um, a lot more promotion or support 
on the sectors that we have in the EU could be could be made. I will stop it. I leave it at it at this. Thank you. Thank you, Rosalie. Thank you for bringing forward the views when it comes to uh, the fisheries sector. Um, I personally didn't know that two thirds of, of of seafood is imported in the EU. So that's a good number to keep it in mind. And thank you also for sharing all those examples from different countries where our seafood products come from. So that's a lot of content in your in the, your intervention. So uh, with that, I would like to thank all the panelists for your uh, very insightful insights in the discussion of today. We're absolutely running out of time. I'm doing a terrible job with managing uh, the discussion, but uh, we have the luxury of having the room for extra 30 minutes, which usually is not something given uh, inside the European Parliament. Um, so I would like just uh, voila, to provide immediately the floor uh, to the next speaker, which is uh, Joke uh, Chauvliège, rapporteur uh, for the opinion on the legislative framework for sustainable food system at the Committee of the Region. Apologies for my horrible pronunciation of your name, and uh, you have the floor. Thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity to speak here. And um, don't worry about pronouncing my name. I know I have a terrible name to speak out in English. Uh, you said correct, Joke. Most time it's joke, they say, so I'm very glad that you say Joke. Just Schovliege, that's too French speaking. It's Schovliege in uh, more in uh, in Dutch. But uh, no, don't worry. Uh, it's uh, it's not bad. You did very very well. So um, thank you for the opportunity. As I said, I am a member of the Committee of the Regions, and that's uh, the EU body uh, representing local and regional authorities. Our committee is also part of the advisory group of um, intergroup that works on policy areas with a, a strong and local and regional dimension. The topic of today, uh, of course, is a very good example. And I think we all uh, agree this afternoon that uh, the way we produce our food today is, is not sustainable. Our global uh, food system is broken and it needs to be fixed. So what can we do um, to change that? What can local and regional authorities do? So, so speaking on behalf of the Committee of the Regions, I would first like to highlight the role that local and regional authorities can play in implementing measures and shape healthier food environments um, while promoting healthy and sustainable diets. So local and regional authorities have the capacity to facilitate access to healthy food and give people the good options with an adequate urban spatial planning, for example. And there I always give um, the example, no fast food restaurant near to school. Uh, they come out of the school and they go to the McDonald's, as I can uh, name one, but can also be another one. Um, and, and when you have next to school uh, some healthy foods and, and, and it's affordable, Young people will go there and will not go to the McDonald's because it's not in, in the neighborhood. It, it's just a stupid example, but I think it's, uh, it's very important to mention here because today when I go to the station and take my train, I only pass uh, unhealthy food and I'm not in the possibility to get something healthy before I go home. So cities and, and regions, they can do a lot. And uh, of course, they have a very useful and efficient tool, and it's mentioned already, and that is the food public procurement. And I cannot uh, repeat it enough, public procurement of sustainable, healthy, seasonal and local food represents a powerful tool for transition to more sustainable food. Public fruit, food procurement ticks so many boxes. It brings delicious, seasonal, organic and local food to, to schools, to elderly homes, to hospitals. It links also uh, rural and peri-urban areas to cities while supporting uh, local farmers and uh, local economies. It adds also educational measures uh, to the contract, but also, of course, food waste reduction measures, awareness, raising uh, awareness of social innovation and, and so on. I, I, can, I can go on with, uh, with that. So many European cities and regions are already making use of uh, food uh, public procurement. But to make it fully efficient, and then I, I look uh, to the European Commission, existing constraints within its public uh, procurement rules needs to be eliminated. We need more guidance. We need more training for regions that are magic public buyers. 
And maybe I can also give here an example, the city of Ghent, that's near my uh, place where I live, in my home region, uh, Flanders. They, they are striving to create a shorter food chain and encouraging sustainable food production and consumption. Ghent, the city, is serving 800,000 meals per year. That includes a share of 23% organic and fair products. The menu includes a veggie day, Thursday veggie day, it's called. Everybody knows it. And is based on regional, regionally seasonal produce. The food procurement contract also includes requirements for sustainable fishing, ethically raised animal products, as well as ethical um, working condition for the employees of the catering companies and farmers. Through its uh, contract, the city of Ghent also promotes the reduction of food waste and the reuse of food waste products. Many of, of these local projects merit to be scaled up and shared so that other cities and regions can benefit from them. Importantly, regarding actions at the UN member states level, the Committee of the Regions also expressed its ideas on how to boost of sustainable diets and food productions. I will give you shortly, I try to be short, um, some of uh, our requests. First of all, we called upon the European Commission to publish uh, the framework law for sustainable uh, systems to make sustainability central to all food-related uh, policies, while ensuring, of course, better uh, policy coherence. We called for a revision of the EU school uh, fruit, vegetable and milk scheme to improve uh, children's diets and increase uh, the consumption of healthy, more plant-based, uh, sustainable diets while reconnecting uh, to agriculture. Thirdly, we called, to, uh, we called the national dietary guidelines to be regularly updated to support healthy and sustainable diets. We asked for the alignment of the promotional campaigns for agri-food uh, products with the objectives of the Farm to Fork strategy and, of course, also linked to the EU Beating Cancer Plan. We are pleading for a simple EU-wide and front-of-pack labeling of food products based on robust and independent scientific evidence. We called for pricing policies to align food prices uh, with the true cost of food and to lower the relative price of more sustainable food. And finally, uh, we invite um, uh, you all to read uh, our whole report of the Committee uh, of uh, the Regions on the Framework Law for Sustainable Food System. So the discussion on uh, sustainable food is, of course, linked to a lot of other policy areas. The Committee of the Regions set up uh, also a, a Green uh, Deal uh, Going Local Working Group, and they discuss the different aspects of the Green Deal, especially challenges and opportunities for local and regional communities. So that's very closely linked, I think, to what we discuss here this afternoon. To conclude, and uh, I try to be quick, uh, the transition to more sustainable diets can not only lay, uh, I think, on the shoulders of the consumers. I think uh, Professor Matthijs also mentioned that. Each actor in the food chain, each level of governance, and each of one of us, and uh, uh, we all uh, have, to scale, uh, have, have to scale up our role and we have to play our role. And more than ever, cooperation among different governance levels is, uh, is needed in order to address environmental and health challenges we are all uh, facing. So thank you very much uh, for your attention and thank you once again for uh, inviting the Committee of the Regions uh, to express uh, our concerns. Thank you very much, Joke, for, uh, for your presentation and thank you uh, for sticking with the time and um, also for, uh, voilà, for bringing the, for words, the calls of the Committee of the Regions and I think it's a good way uh, to conclude almost uh, our today's event. So we have uh, two minutes uh, for one uh, burning question from the audience. Um, so is there any hand? Yeah. If you can present yourself. Good afternoon. Um, Andrea Chionero, Public Affairs Manager at the European Flavor Association. Um, uh, I would like to come back a little bit on the um, presentation made by the Professor Matthijs over the, um, the uh, healthy food choices and the system. 
and actually was reflecting a little bit on the barriers. And he, uh, he was talking about a trade-off between health and sustainable food choices with taste, price, social norms, symbolic means, and convenience. And you were opposing taste and health and sustainability. I think that in a future perspective, uh, taste will, will be on the other side of, the, of this equation because as it was also uh, uh, mentioned by MEP Kupula Natri in the, in the opening statement, desirability is also an important factor when it comes to consumer choices and also attractiveness, as it was remembered by the uh, Consumer Association here. Sorry, today. can we just come to the question quickly? Yeah, the question is, do you see the import, the, that good taste will be in the future not a barrier but an enable for food choices and for sustainable food choices thanks well i ha absolutely hope so and i'm looking at uh, the food and drink uh, industry to help us in, in innovation and in making that happen because that's and and not in an ultra processed way right i mean uh, uh, but yeah, absolutely, and I, I think I mean what that's the problem. I mean our in, innate preferences for sugar, salts, things like that. I mean it's it's we're born with that, and then we are socialized from a very early age with those things. So it's not so easy to actually um, change that equation. But yeah, it's a big challenge. Thank you very much. Um, apologies, but we have no time for uh, further questions. Um, I would like just to provide uh, immediately the floor, um, well, back to uh, Professor Matthijs, if you have some closing remarks, or maybe directly to Mr. Olekas, as you prefer. Yeah, thank you, Chair. One very small closing remark, which is, uh, I think, uh, one of the red threats uh, has been, do not generalize, right? I'm a scientist, of course, we don't like to generalize because the comms people, they tell us to make it simple, right? So there's a big paradox here um, uh, because people do need simple cues and simple messages, but then we have these complexities where, you know, you, you can't generalize things. Uh, and of course, there's a danger for immobilization because if you don't generalize, you can't produce easy messages. And if you don't have easy messages, you can't change anything. So there's a, there's a, difficult uh, challenge for us as a community to break that. And I don't have the solution, but I have only one uh, call uh, as a scientist. Well, let's collect data. And, and not only on greenhouse gas emission, but also on, on biodiversity impacts. Let's collect data on economic indicators, on social indicators, on nutritional indicators. And let's, you know, uh, base our decisions indeed on, on, on data and on good information. I think that's that's key, and we are definitely lacking or, or needing uh, frameworks, thinking of PATH, for example, to, to, to go forward in that respect. So that would be my closing remark. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, I would like to thank all participants, and uh, I think that especially after the professor uh, remarks uh, that we uh, have there some room for improvement of, of uh, food system and we have the scientific advice. I think it's very important for us as politicians to, to uh, make uh, our decision on the scientific uh, knowledges. Uh, and it was mentioned that there's no one a single diet for solving all problems. I, I think it was also very important that we should have the holistic approach improving the, the food system and looking how this uh, food system uh, act on the environment and how we can implement and, uh, this, this uh, policies in, in different regions. The, the region was very uh, important for us because we have the different habits, different uh, traditions, and uh, also how, how we can um, this improve. I'll also just mention that we need to, there are different gaps between the Member states, we should maybe allocate additional resources and knowledges uh, to, to support uh, and how we can solve the, the, the food waste. So I think it's one of the 
very important issue, having in mind the diets and food system and, and uh, economy. And also, uh, it was uh, mentioned that it's very important to keep in mind always the, the farmers who produce this, how, how they act, how we can support them to guarantee that the social sustainability and economical sustainability for for them. And uh, this, I think, it's uh, it's really very very important to discuss this issue in this in this house, where we can uh, having this whole information to achieve that some kind maybe take compromise or, or lead for for the for for the future once again thank you very much and uh, for coming and for sharing you uh, information and statements and i hope that together we have the, the room and the possibilities to move forward thank you Well, just a small thank you also from my side. Thank you for staying until the end of the event. Apologies a tiny bit for the, for the delay. And uh, I think we have all learned a lot today, so let's keep working together and bring these priorities ahead also in the next EP mandate. Thank you.